Hey guys, we have taken the road trip. We are in Orlando, Florida. We're still down here at HITS, and we are enjoying this week with all the great instruction, all the great, great knowledge, and the people that have come down here to teach. And, you know, I'm just like a sponge. You know, I can't, I can't get enough. Um, I'm probably going home with Carpal Tunnel, where I've wrote so much and got writer's cramp, because I want to put this stuff to use. I want to learn how to make the dogs better. I sat through behavioral classes today. I sat through how dogs learn and, and odor conditioning. Uh, I've sat through tracking classes. I've sat through officer down um, with canine use. Um, that's all been today. It's not what we did yesterday. But just I, I'm just trying to soak it up. And just that way I can relay this this information to you guys. So I have fortunate enough to be sitting here today with one of our instructors, and we are sitting here with Dr. Nathan Hall from Texas Tech University. He is a associate professor for the animal sciences department, and Dr. Hall is doing a lot of studies and research on odor and how it works and how the dogs behave um, with odor with the different levels of odor. So you would say um, the weight or amount, it could be surface area, we, can, we won't go into all that. And what happens when the odor is not present over a, a period of time? So we are gonna get a little nerdy on this one. We're gonna talk about how, how the dogs work. Um, we've got some interesting tidbits I think you guys are gonna enjoy. But Dr. Hall, I really appreciate you being here and How's things been in Florida for you today? Oh, it's been a beautiful day. I saw the rain, which is a bit of a change from the desert of Lubbock. So there was the the guys running the booth from California ran outside <laughs> and were literally videotaping it raining. Yep. And I was like, "What are you doing?" And they're like, "We don't see it rain. Like I know. we're we're in fire season." And they videoed it and was sending it back home to some of their friends. I thought that was pretty neat because. Or like, oh, you know, here we go, rain again. So, you know, in Virginia, where I'm from, like we've been having a lot of storms, um, you know, pretty much morning and evening or pretty much every evening we've been getting a lot of showers. This mm. is probably one of the wettest Augusts that I can remember in a long time. So with wet comes humidity. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about that a little bit and, you know, some of the stuff that you're starting to implement. But so, and you're originally from Florida. Yes. And so just we're almost in your back door. Pretty close. Pretty yeah. close, yeah. yeah. All right, so tell us a little bit about you. Tell us about your background. You know, you and I have talked about it. You know, where you studied, uh, where your school started, and what actually got you into the animal science program? Like, what, what piqued your interest? Uh, well, so I'd always been interested in animals. Um, growing up, I was sort of on the pre-vet track in undergrad, okay. and then I got into research. I had a you know, when I was doing my undergraduate degree, there was a research program where I was at, which was University of Florida, mm -hmm. and uh, they were doing, you know, dog cognition research, and I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. And now, uh, was Cameron involved in that? Is no, that, this was... Not at the time? No, yeah. so uh, this was um, with Clive Wynn, um, uh -huh. uh, going back to around 2010, 2011, mm -hmm. um, and once I started getting into that, it was complicated. Research is complicated. Mm -hmm. And trying to get to answers was complicated. And I'm sort of a sucker for complicated problems mm -hmm. that just never go away. Right. And that's basically what research is, is you never answer. You can do n nothing more than answer one small question and come up with 10 more. more and that's pretty much all research is. And I just can't stop <laughs> yeah so well, good hey we're on our end the law enforcement side especially with the odor um we want to know mm -hmm. like we want to know and you know data and facts drive a lot of things of course you know that that's why you're doing your research so and then after florida where did you go uh so from university of florida i did a postdoc at arizona state university mm -hmm. and then uh, after that i started as an assistant professor at texas tech university in 2016 mm -hmm. and have been there ever since 
And so 2016 is when, does that when the research started on the program you're doing now or was there something different? No. So we actually, um, uh, Texas Tech sort of created a plan for a companion animal program in mm-hmm. animal science. So my actual uh, sort of educational background is in psychology. So mm-hmm. I'm an experimental psychologist by training, but um, Texas Tech and their animal science department wanted a companion animal program. So they basically created three faculty lines and was like, let's find people who do companion animal stuff and Mm -hmm. you figure out a program. So uh, I was part of one of the original three. Uh, So there wasn't any program there before us and they just said, create something. I was like, well, I really like the detection dog stuff, so that's what I'm going to create. And then um, it took me about a year to get it started. So I really kind of count. 2017 is the first mm-hmm. sort of official year of getting stuff done. Um, but then we've been running from 2017 till now. So, and when you started the detection program, was it, because I know you talked in your class today a lot about explosives. So was it narcotics or ex- was it more deemed towards explosives? Uh, I mean, at first it was deemed towards just anything arbitrary and just mm-hmm. detection and self. So we were using a lot of laboratory odors and things like that because mm-hmm. uh, we were getting sort of things off the ground going. Right. And then um, and nobody knew about us. We just sort of created a program, right? When you think of detection dogs, you mm-hmm. think of PennVet, you think of Auburn. No yeah. one thought of Texas Tech, right? So right. we sort of had to build that from the ground up. And we did that by starting with a very basic, you know, um, you know, whatever kind of poor man's things we could put together with any kind of lab odors and got some research going until we got to a point where people would say, oh, you've got publications in this area. Mm-hmm. And then from there, we sort of had to identify, well, what are the things that need addressing? Um, because our research has to be sponsored by something. So mm-hmm. the, the universities don't like sustain that kind of research programs internally. They're usually always coming in from some type of external research. And then, uh, so we just sort of had to identify, well, where are the current problems and where are the things that people need something addressed towards? And in terms of priorities of concerns, explosives are up there. So um, that's where we were able to sort of get some of our uh, initial funding and seed lines to start programs, and that's why we've been kind of explosives heavy. We do some stuff for... um, like agriculture and f- mm-hmm. trying to find um, either pests like spotted lanternfly, but also potential diseases like powdery mildew. Mm-hmm. So that's also within our program. We're not odor specific. We did something with invasive mussels mm. um, down in Texas. So we're not like just explosives, but you know, sort of our, we're always trying to understand the fundamentals, but what our odor is depends on what problem somebody else has. Right. And then we just kind of tailor the research to, f- to fit and address specific needs. So when you started this program, what, what was the specific need that you saw for the explosive side of it? What, what was not clicking or what was the concern that you said, okay, we need to f- research this and figure out what's going on? I wouldn't say it was anything specific to explosives. Um, there's really been kind of two like motivators within the industry that I've been trying to kind of fit in. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is trying to develop that basic line of research. So one of the things that I've always kind of focused my program around is that uh, we run a program that is, uh, you know, the lab wrap kind of program. Mm-hmm. It's we can do like we never, we don't sell dogs. We don't produce dogs. We don't have that as one of our components, which means that we have ultimate freedom in terms of doing something. So if we were going to do a research study that we're like, no one's ever thought to do this because they, you know, you could screw up the dog and it would never become a great working dog. Mm -hmm. That's not a problem for us. If the, you know, if they're not going to become a great working dog, they will be a great pet dog. Mm -hmm. Maybe they can never find that explosive ever again for the rest of their life. But that's not a problem for us because we're not trying to push these dogs operationally. Mm-hmm. What we're trying to understand is the fundamentals. So we try to keep ourselves as like a high risk, high reward mm-hmm. kind of program where we have the freedom to kind of like, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. No one's really done that before. It may or may not work. Let's try it. Um, so that was one of, one of our motivators. Um, and then the second was trying to bring in the experimental psychology behavioral side. So um, there's, you know, 
historically there's been lots of chemists in this industry, mm-hmm. you know, and we, we definitely need the chemists. I work with chemists very closely, so that's a very fundamental component. Um, but what I was trying to hit on a little bit in the talk today was that chemistry is one piece of the puzzle, you know, psychology, behavior, and just how sensory systems work are very learning and experience dependent. So trying to understand how learning and experience influence that side of the, you know, you know, trying to pick up that dog and that behavior and cognition component, how that relates to it um, has been sort of our other focus. Right. So, because that's that stuff that I want to know. Um, what was it during the learning process with the odor? What is something that you've taken away or you've learned from that that that's in common with all dogs? So, and you and I had talked. We'll probably let's go back. Let's back up. You and I had talked, and um, let's talk about the dogs that you get. Um, you know how you take an array of dogs. It doesn't matter. Like I said, you had a you know a, a pity a pit in the, one of the videos or a pit mix. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about, you know, the dogs you bring in. And you've had some hounds um, during your tenure there and doing that. Just talk about that and then, you know, what happens, you adopt them out or whatever. Yep. So we run a train-to-adopt program. Um, and so we're kind of the temporary stomping grounds for a variety of dogs through a variety of situations. Um, so part of our companion animal program in general is that we have a lot of students who are learning to become dog trainers. So some are dog trainers, some are pre-vet. And they take classes in behavior and training. And as part of those classes of behavior and training, they... Uh, So the dog training part, is this for companion animals? Or is this for, like, detection work? Or is there a certain... Or is it just... It could be anything. It can be anything. So the classes themselves are typically oriented towards... Uh, training for adoption, so sit mm-hmm. down, stay, go to bed, things like that. Then they'll also do more advanced things like cooperative care. Can mm-hmm. you know I trim your nails without uh, yeah. any issues? Can I clean your ears? Things like that. And then they'll also do uh, like special programs either on detection or maybe they'll do a little bit of agility. Mm-hmm. Um, but then those dogs also participate in the research programs where we experimentally will train them for detection purposes. Right. Um, and then, uh, so those dogs sort of come from all varieties. Some will be dropouts from working dog programs that mm-hmm. dropped out for any kind of reason, whether it be maybe they were afraid of stairs and that was just a no go for that particular situation. Mm-hmm. But for us, we, we, just don't run the dog on stairs. It's right. not that big of an issue. Right. Uh, but then also we'll have dogs that um, are typical long-term stays mm-hmm. um, from a shelter environment, and we uh, will bring them as part of our program, and they sort of have a uh, program to work on their adoptability. They get multiple walks a day, play sessions, and training every single day, and the goal is that um, – through that program, they'll become more adoptable and be adopted out by the end. So we kind of cycle through mm-hmm. cohorts every couple of months and every semester um, because we push all, everyone out for adoption. So I want to ask you, okay, on the research side and the data collecting. So if you're collecting accurate data, then if you collect accu- accurate data, how do you know that each dog is performing the same? Yeah. Like, so the dog you had in the video today, um, let's say that it, you know, it's a solid dog. You get accurate results, the same results. Then what happens when you come in and they're, they're, it's skewed? Yeah. So we'll, you'll get a, occasional situations like that, um, but that's also not something that's abnormal of any component of the industry, right? Not mm-hmm. every dog makes right. a working dog program. Not every dog makes a particular situation, and we appreciate having that variability. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that we can do from a research perspective is that uh, our experimental designs are usually set that every dog is their own control. So mm-hmm. instead of comparing dog X versus Y and seeing like, oh, I did this to dog X and he's great and did this to dog Y, mm-hmm. that could be because dog X was great to begin with and it didn't matter what you did, you mm-hmm. know, that those kinds of things are obviously hard to see. But we can separate out our experiments that you're comparing dog X to dog X, dog Y to dog Y, dog Z to dog Z. And sometimes even though you might have differences individually, like dog X was better than dog Z, 
but typically the direction of any kind of effect, like, Mm -hmm. oh, if we did this, dog X got better, is typically the same that if I did this, dog Z got better. Even though their baselines were a little bit different, that increase in performance is quite similar, and that actually tends to be quite consistent. Mm. Um, So not to say that we never get any outliers. You occasionally Mm -hmm. do. Um, But generally, we spend a lot of time thinking in terms of experimental design, how to avoid those kinds of things, and plan our experiments so that any individual variability is not going to be substantially detrimental to the actual results that come out. Got it. It's just like a certification. That dog has to meet this standard. Then he can go into your testing process or your research process. Mm -hmm. Like if our dogs don't meet a standard, they don't, they don't, we can't use them. Right. So that's the same thing you're saying. Yep. 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 So all of our dogs are trained to a specific standard and a criterion. Mm -hmm. Um, We've been lucky enough that all of the dogs that we've picked have met those standards and criteria, so that really hasn't been an issue. But mm. there are standards and criteria that if they don't meet a certain accuracy level, detection performance level, um, then obviously we just can't measure things if yeah. they're not if they're not being responsive to odor in, in a particular way. So yep. um, that's always a part of the start of every program. Got it. Well, there we are. So let's talk about odor. Let's talk because this is what you're you you do. How, how does the odor process, how does the dog learn the odor process? So you're in sitting in your class today. I really felt like our dogs in the hound community, um, correlated more with the explosive detection dog. And I will tell you why here in a minute, when we talk about a a certain topic, when we talk about the extinction training, um, because I feel like that fits a lot of the mold um, that we have, but the difference in the sense, you are using a, a chemical component to make an odor, which i.e. the explosive, mm-hmm. and where we are using a natural scent yep. that comes from a mammal. So just talk to us a little bit about the learning process with odor, how the dogs learn, and you know what what you see is like, um, a time frame because that's something you know we some guys start puppies at at 12 weeks old you know I start mine six to eight to ten months old and don't put a lot of so is that something you can kind of engage with and, and talk a little bit about the process mm-hmm. so um, uh, in terms of learning the process is is typical through uh, things like operant classical conditioning mm-hmm. um, where essentially the odor itself, um, becomes associated with some type of external or final reward, toy, food, something like that. Mm-hmm. And really, there's I like to separate it, and there's two main components, or you know, it's a chain that you're trying to link together. Mm-hmm. And that first part is searching to get to an odor, right? And then once you get to the odor, making some type of response to indicate that hey, it's here. Mm-hmm. Um, so different disciplines will have those links look di- very different, right? If you're in explosives world, you have a very sort of patterned search that ends in a very specific final response, like a sit or a down or something like that. If you're in search and rescue, you know, then you have a very long and sort of wielding search that can look quite differently. And in some cases, that final response may be the least important component of it, right? That mm-hmm. they'll be looking at some other kinds of biological responses, things like that. Um, it, it, you know, in the same with tracking and trailing, right? A lot of, most of those things are going to be on that search and less on that train final response kinds of component. Yep. And uh, so in terms of learning, there's really two, two separate components of learning. One mm-hmm. is searching behaviors that lead to odor you have to learn how to search, search. appropriately right um you know think about you know how do you search if you lose your keys in the house right there's do you do a systematic search do you do random search right do yeah. you remember the places that you were at last you know there's a variety of different kinds of search things that can go on and you learn and the dogs can learn how do they optimize that search to increase the probability of finding an odor mm-hmm. so that's kind of component one Component two is when I find the odor, how do I tell you so that you can pay me? And that's kind of component two. And a lot of times we'll focus initial imprinting really is that sort of second component. Right. Odor is here. Do something to tell me it's here. 
and then I'll pay you. And you sort of build that chain. And then where you, you know, the second component can almost be stitched together separately, but where the real trick comes in is stitching together that searching, get to odor, tell you that I found it, now get paid. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot of times where the trick is and where a lot of the development of the dog goes is, you know, how do I optimize that search patterns? How do I optimize search in general? And how do I learn what that ratio of effort in terms of search to finding odor to getting paid is so that the dogs can engage in, you know, very substantial searches or hunts to um, find the odor and, and get rewarded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I liked the analogy used with the Coke machine versus a slot machine. And we're going to talk about that in a minute when we get to um, the, the part of ours. So I want to back up and, and, and talk about the two different um, phases of that. So first for the search for us, you know, our dog has to be able to find that odor. So we rely a lot on natural instinct. Like I, I can't, I can't really teach a, a dog to search. He, our dogs have to have good hunt drive mm -hmm. um, because we may be out. We may be out all day. You know, we, my dogs may be out two or three or four days at a time and not find that odor. So I'm relying on a lot of natural instinct um, for that. And again, we're going to get back to this extension because I thought that was so crucial um, for what we do. And then once they find it, you know, they, we want a dog that opens. So we're looking for th that excitability for that, um, that first, re first reinforcer, which is finding the odor is what you, you know, how you were, were talking about it. And then our primary reward is actually catching the game, either treeing the raccoon or, um, catching the bear and treeing the bear, which a lot of times with bear hunting or lion hunting, um, your big game hunting, it becomes, they actually get to see it. So it, it flips over from using your nose to, oh, there it is. Now can I get to it? Can I get to it? Can I get to it? Um, so our process is the same. It's just we don't have, um, we don't, we test our dogs for that drive, hunt drive. Um, and we've got dogs, some dogs that don't have it, which is what we're talking, you know, you wouldn't use that dog in your process. And then our, our dogs, a lot of, you know, the dogs that we're hunting has to have it because mm -hmm. it's not a, um, it's not a choice. <laughs> it's right. got, it's, it's got to hunt. I mean, a dog's got to hunt. I got that sticker on my, my, do, my box. Actually, it says this, this dog will hunt because he has to, he has mm -hmm. to go hunting. So you actually broke down one of the, um, the odors and how small of odor can that dog detect? Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so a lot of the things that we'll do are threshold measurements and mm -hmm. basically what's that minimum concentration that's detectable. So a lot of times we think of, you know, odor and dogs as magic, but there's, you know, real physical things that are going on behind that and that there mm -hmm. have to be a physical certain amount of, of molecules of a particular odor per mm -hmm. amount of air to get to the nose that becomes detectable. And Anything below that amount is undetectable. We can't smell it. They can't smell it. Anything above that is something that they can detect. So one of the things that we spend a lot of time on is working how do we uh, behaviorally figure out what is that minimum concentration of that odor that they can detect and how does training, experience, and learning influence what that minimum concentration is that they can detect. So what is that? What what? What does the train? What training do you do to develop that? So, um, I mean, in terms of what the threshold is for certain odors, it depends on each odor, and it's very, very specific and can change massively depending on on what it is. Yes. How we test it is we train the dogs to do a simple search, and we normally do what we call a three alternative force mm -hmm. choice. There's uh, one present, you know, one sample or one port has the odor, the other two are blanks, mm -hmm. and just train the dog to tell us which one has the odor. If they get it right, we give it to them again. If they get it right, we give it to them again. If they get it right, we give it to them again. And then if they get three correct in a row, then we're like, okay, they can detect this, no problem. So then we decrease the concentration. And then we do it again. And we keep going down until we get to that point where they miss something. 
If they miss something, we go back up in concentration. And if they get it right, we go back down. If they miss it, we go back up. If they get it right, we go back down. And we get to a point where we're kind of bouncing, mm -hmm. calling these real, like reversals. If we go anything lower than this, they get it wrong. If we go anything higher than this, they get it right. So then we find this point where they keep reversing, and then we say threshold is somewhere between those two reversal points. Yeah. Which, with, you know, with our animal, I think it more plays into elements. With, I mean, because, you know, whether you have a 400-pound bear or a 200-pound bear, you know, they're still dropping, you know, 40,000 particles a minute. Um, now, some of those are dead particles and some of them are live particles. And the live particles don't, don't, don't hit the ground as fast. They'll stay in the air longer. Where the dead rafts will literally, you know, pretty much cling to the ground immediately. So the dog's got to figure out, you know, the dog's getting two, literally two different scent pictures at the time with with that. So, um, yeah, I think the elements play a lot more into it. And you've just recently started a study with the elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, to back up a little bit in terms of, you know, when it comes to actual animal or human tracking or any of those components, mm -hmm. you know, what is the quote-unquote scent from a scientific perspective, the answer is we have no idea. Yeah. Um, it's how it behaves, how it moves, what is it, what volatiles, are all of them the same? Is it a specific ratio? What ratio is that? All of these questions are unanswered, unanswered. and no idea. But when you do research on it, I'm going to be the first one knocking on your door because <laughs> I want to know. Yeah, and, and I don't think people understand that with, odor, with you know, odor or scent. Um, do, do you differentiate between... Um, odor that's made and body odor scent or um, animal odor scent? Yeah, I mean... Or is odor odor? So there's... Uh, yeah, there's... This is where you sort of get into the... Sometimes there is functional use of having very precise terminology. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it's nitpicking of terminology. Yeah, so it, don't matter. It, yeah. So it depends on what it is. I mean, there are definitely people that say, you are wrong for this, but these are all human inventions, right? Mm -hmm. There's no like correct answer that this mm -hmm. equals this and that equals that, other than that is what you have defined it as and that is what you have defined right. it as. So in those cases, as long as you define what you're talking about, yeah. it, it doesn't matter too much. The only one that I tend to follow a little bit is that, um, and that's just more because of that's common in the... Uh, scientific circles is that odorant is a specific molecule. Odor is Multiple. smell, something, yeah, yeah where, where it's a little bit more confusing. So, like, your banana has an odor. Amyl acetate, the chemical, is the odorant. Ah. Um, outside of that, then, as long as you specify what it is that you're talking about, then I'm not, I'm not going to nitpick and, yeah. and pull apart and say that this is the right way and that is the wrong way. Because yeah. sometimes, uh, and I, I try specifically not to do that because, you know, scientists a lot of times will get very paranoid about those kinds of things for good reason, but then it makes it seem like that's what science is about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, saying that this word means this and that word means that, mm -hmm. that is really only step one of science, but that really has nothing to do with the scientific endeavor and process you know, it's important to have defined terms, but that itself is not science. And because scientists spend so much time being nitpicky about those things that I think that it actually makes it seem like that's what science is. So for me, I don't actually spend too much time trying to nitpick those things <laughs> yeah. as long as it's clear what we're talking about. And in this case, scent, odor, something very complex, what's coming off of people, what's coming off of animals. The answer is I have, we have no idea what it is, how it is. Is it, you know, actual, you know, particles? What are those particles? Are, you know, is it, well, yeah, what component that is? We don't know. People, people will say very clearly what they think it is or what they've heard it is, but from the scientific perspective. Why, why, very, why has it never been uh, measured or replicated? It's hard. Yeah. Um, I mean, from, there's really a couple of different driving factors. One is... Research costs money. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, we rightfully so put most of our money into cancer research, heart attack research, you know, things like that. Yeah. So that when it comes to understanding 
what is the scent of a person that tends to be like on priority list, you know, 10 million way down here, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, and occasionally certain agencies <laughs> will have certain problems for, you know, what that might necessarily need. But yeah, part of that is just, uh, you know, research costs money. So you need a driver for it. And then secondly, you know, you naturally want to pick the low hanging fruit to understand something first. Uh -huh. And, you know, if we're still struggling with relatively simple things, right? like, you know, explosives in themselves are relatively, you know, air quote, simple, but yet that itself becomes so incredibly complicated that there's still so much to sort out than just the entire concept of trying to understand an animal's odor, then oof, that's just like, yeah, you've got to be, you got to be dedicated to that process and trying to sort things out. Um, so a lot of times it just becomes, that's hard. So yeah. we'll save that for us for another day. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like I said, that would be the hound community would eat that a lot. Well, the dog community, you know, especially tracking humans <clears throat> because we, we can't see it. We can't smell it. The dog's telling us the story and yeah, we have no clue. And I, I mean, I just come out of Jeff Shetler's class and you know, he, some, he was given a, video and he asked a question and somebody raised their hand and said oh yeah and he goes oh can you see scent can you smell it and everybody's like oh <laughs> no you can't so I, exactly so let's get into a little bit of the the extinction training because like i said this is one of the interesting things um that i thought was interesting um with the dog and the the, the lessening of the drive so tell us a little bit about that um, the reward system and how that drives the the extinction of the tr of the the drive, and then we're going to flip that over and tell why that's different in our hounds, and how the reward process is different through their thought, their psychology. Yeah, so um, I guess the basics of it is sort of going back to that chain again, as you have that first part where you have to search, you know, engage in some type of mm -hmm. search come across an odor, then you can make a response and get that sort of final reward in the typical explosives detection circle. Um, one thing that can happen are think of situations where you're searching and searching and searching and searching, and you never come across that odor which allows you to make that response, which allows you to get that sort of final reward. What can happen there is that, you know, the dogs will start losing search behavior because search doesn't pay off in the end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, an example of that is I don't fish, I don't golf. Why? I've been fishing so many times where I never caught anything. Mm -hmm. It's extinguished. I'm a bad fisherman. I don't know. <laughs> I must have been doing something wrong. But if you go out there and you fish a particular area and fish a particular area and fish a particular area over and over and over and over and over and again, and you've never caught anything, there will be some point where you either say, I'm going to go somewhere else, right? Change mm -hmm. something up or give up completely. Right. And fundamentally, it's a similar <clears throat> process. If you have experience where, oh, sometimes they bite today, sometimes they don't bite today, right? You'll have days where you go without completely, mm -hmm. but then you'll have a day where you find, you know, you get one, two, three fish. And that kind of variable, I don't know if something's coming, but something's going to come that is what can maintain very prolonged search. Mm -hmm. But if you're going out for the first time, right, you take a friend out fishing who's never been fishing before, you catch nothing. You're like, just, just trust me. Come on, one more time. You take them out again. Don't catch anything for another day. How likely are they going to be like, I can't wait to go fishing again? I mean, yeah. there could be other rewards, right? You're drinking <laughs> beer or something on a boat, right? Yeah. Outside of that. But in terms of actually catching, you know, getting that type of reward, it can, it can die out pretty quick, particularly if you have situations where if I go to this lake, there's no fish in it, right? Or if you go to a particular area and you've never caught a fish, what do you do? You move to another particular area. And dogs can be very sensitive to, hey, this area, there's nothing and there never will be anything. Whereas in these areas, there can be a high rate of targets and mm -hmm. dogs can become sensitive <clears throat> that, yeah, I'm not going to find anything there. So why even search? What can differentiate, you know, your hounds or finding some type of biologically driven scent mm -hmm. is that, you know, those things and depending on, you know, how the odor is moving and how the odor is behaving, those can be things that 
are highly, you know, rewarding in of themselves. Mm-hmm. That, you know, the odor itself can be rewarding and that that can be almost biologically related and not necessarily something that you're just depending on conditioning with that dog to say, hey, you should care about this odor because I'll reward you for it. That can come along with, that's just a biologically rewarding odor, like the smell of food, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of times you don't have to be trained, you know, to, in, to be interested when a smell of food comes along. There are strong biological connections to that. Um, and then you also have situations where, depending on what the odor is, uh, you know, the odor might be moving in such a way that it just kind of hits you. And if you're searching and searching and searching and searching and you don't find anything, you may stop that detailed search behavior or very systematic search, but you might just be doing other things and like, oh, you know, what's over here, what's over here, what's over here, and then, oh, I smell it, I'm back into the game kinds of things. So sometimes, you know, you might just be moving randomly and, and the dog is not actually engaged in a search kind of pattern, you know, maybe their head's off somewhere else, if you will, and they're not actually looking for that odor, but then all of a sudden they're doing something else, but it's like, oh, I recognize that. There it is. And that can change something. So that can, you know, it's not like, um, you know, when you're out in the forest and doing something that's, you know, motivating and interesting for the dog. It's not like you're going on a city block walk or something like that or, you know, searching the same room over and over and over again. It's a very different task. So there's a lot of other motivators to keep the dog just walking around in the forest. It's not like dogs get bored of going into the forest in a way. But, you know, sometimes there might not be searching systematically. They just happen to come across the odor and you've transversed enough area that you then hit the odor and then now we're playing that game. Yep. So just so the listeners have a clear picture of what we're talking about is when you go out in the mornings and man, you get those dogs out of the truck and you're, let's just say you're free casting them and you're walking, you're walking out the, the, the top of the mountain or you're picked a ridge line and you're going out there. I mean, the dogs are excited. I mean, they're hustling, you know, they're here, they're checking up here, they're running back down, you know, they're back and forth. And as that day prolongs, the dogs are less active and less active. And then by the end of the day, you haven't struck a track and you're headed back to the truck, and pretty much the dogs are almost healing beside you. They're here. They're right here. And then you happen to cross a holler, and all of a sudden, heads go up. Everybody starts barking. They actually weren't hunting for that odor. They were just they were just in walking mode. You know, at this point, I haven't found anything the first five hours of our, our trip. So, you know, we're headed back to the, to the truck, or we're headed to a pickup point, and we come across that odor, and the excitability went up, and then it's almost like a self-rewarding behavior for the dog mm-hmm. because, um, you know, I can't plant that odor there. It's not a controlled environment for us. Um, the dog hits the odor, and bam, the race is on, the game starts, and here we go. And one of the things that in class when you were talking about it is how quick, like for for the example you were given is, um, today the dog gets a reward every time he hits odor and the odor's planted. Boom, odor, reward, odor, reward. We search this room, odor, reward. And then tomorrow we come out and there's no odor and no reward. That drive diminished pretty quickly, didn't it? Mm-hmm. And if you do that over and over, the dogs can learn very quickly what game are we playing today. It's like my daughter in fishing. Maddie, you explain Maddie to a T. She likes to trout fish because they stock and we're able to catch fish pretty consistently. But when we go out on the river and we're doing our musky fishing, she don't want any part of it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the fish of 10,000 casts. Yeah. And she's like, Dad, like I'm bored, I want to go home. I'm like, well, bass fish for a little bit. So, I mean, you're explaining things that we all see. We all see this stuff. We all see it with our kids and our friends and and so on and so forth. But so why would why do you think and you explained it to me, why do you think that the odor that we have planted for the dog to reward his self, um, explosives, narcotics, um, you know, HRD, whatever, 
Um, how is that different from, and you explained it a little bit, the, the odor of the actual game that we're chasing. How do we, how do, how does our dogs stay? How do my, how am I able to hunt a dog for 10 years? And there may be weeks. In fact, when I first started hunting 30, you know, almost 30 years ago, we may only see five bear in a year. Mm -hmm. How did those dogs stay motivated to search and catch game? Or was it to the point that basically I was going on a walk towards the end of the season and just happened to run across it? Yeah, I mean, obviously for that situation, I don't know, but I would guess that you were probably just going for a beautiful stroll. Yeah, day and, after day after day. <laughs> and so dogs don't forget odor. You know, once, mm -hmm. once they've been trained and they, they know a particular thing, that part sort of remains intact because when you're searching and searching and not finding odor, that's different from searching finding odor, not getting paid or not getting rewarded or something mm -hmm. like that. That's, that's a different ball game and that's extinction of the whole thing and it'll just mm -hmm. stop responding to that odor. In the same way, like if they came across the smell of a bear, which is probably what I would do is hook the dog up and get out of there nah. real quick, right? <laughs> you know, so in that case, then that would be extinction of the whole thing and they'll learn not to, 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 to follow chase. that. But in, you know, in a situation where you've been searching and not finding anything, in the same way that you, you think about yourself, right? Are you going to be looking left and right and doing a detailed visual search that entire walk on the way back? You're probably just going for a nice stroll, you know, passing around. And then if you happen to see a bear in a tree, you'd be like, oh my, you know, yeah. there it is, right? You yeah. know, then I can't believe I, I, I came across that. And the odor can be the same way. The dog is just going on a nice stroll and uh, that search behavior has extinguished, but that Odor recognition has not. Not diminished. So in a case where, you know, you're just going uh, out in that case, it's not that, or you have a biological scent that could be strong, like, mm -hmm. you know, you're near an animal that's the, got the fresh a ton scent. of smell or a mm -hmm. fresh scent, then it's going to hit you in the face. You're going to be like, what was that? You know, and then, you know, that picks up right away. Where, you know, you can see problems are going to be odors that are very concealed, low concentration, something where you would need a detailed pickup. So mm -hmm. in that situation, if you had a really old trail, mm -hmm. and these are all guesses, obviously, without testing, but I would bet in that situation, the dogs would have been walking old trails left and right, whereas maybe in the first day or in that, you know, first mm -hmm. coming out in the morning, they'd be picking up particularly old trails, and they're following them very closely. Uh, but towards the end of it, that is all being walked. But if you come across a really strong fresh scent uh -huh. you just can't walk past it you right. know it's, it, it would be the same. instinctively it's too strong yeah or you know or like you just if you just happened to walk by and you saw a bear sitting out there looking at you you wouldn't just walk past it uh -huh. you would you would immediately find it but you may not have been doing that sort of detailed visual search to sort of mm -hmm. look very closely out in the distance kind of thing so so our, and i'm trying to put this in my in a visual for my head so the dogs would not, and I mean, I'm seeing exactly what you're explaining. I've seen it throughout the day, um, especially towards the end of season when the tracks get harder to find. I do see the dogs um, roaming. So our, we free, when, we, when we free cast our dogs, they're allowed to roam. Mm -hmm. um, my dogs hunt pretty close. They're 100 to 200 yards. They'll be around me. Um, and they don't venture out much. But now at the first of the season, they may venture out four or 500 yards. But as the season goes and, the, and it gets, you know, I go two or three days without finding a track, I do see that that close, they start honing in, mm -hmm. which so the hunt is diminishing me. And that's where I'm picking up the slack and, and not even realizing it, I'm picking up the slack for these dogs by walking harder and longer to cross that fresher scent mm -hmm. um, than the dogs actually roaming out that 400, 500 yards up on that hillside and, and going hunting for that. Right. But I actually see that behavior. Um, now that you're saying that, like, I, I'm going to, I see it a lot. Mm -hmm. So that, that part of the class was very intriguing to me. Um, on the diminished drive or extinction yep. of, of the odor. And even though our dogs are programmed. So uh, another question, 
I'd like to hit on. How long does it take to program a dog per odor? So if you were if you were imprinting, mm-hmm. which I I know what I think in my mind because I imprint a lot of dogs. So for me as a as a houndsman and I I you know a raccoon or a bear or a cat or deer or coyote, a hog, how many times do you think they have to be on that odor to to say I got this? So yeah, for the odors that you work with. I don't know if it's an odor that we're working with. Two trials. If the dogs already know how to search, if the dogs... Two times. I mean, it's quick. It's, it's, it happens, like, almost... Uh, it, it's ridiculously fast. I mean, in a in five-minute session, a handful of trials, you can get dogs transferred over to a new odor very, very quickly. Wow. That, that part is... Training that search, that long duration search, mm-hmm. you know, those components, given the correct alert, those things can take a little yes. while, yeah. you know, and building that first odor, you know, f- for when we run through our program, mm-hmm. we give our best dogs about a week, our worst dogs three weeks mm-hmm. to be able to search three of our ports and make a response to one of them uh, for an odor. But then once we switch to a different odor, I mean, that happens within a day. That's, we don't usually allocate more than a day for that. Because they've already learned. Because they already learned all the components, and then yeah. you're just adding a new odor. And then mm-hmm. adding that odor to their repertoire, is that part seems just really fast. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, the guy that was teaching the combat tracking yesterday was talking about um, double-laid tracks, and well, that, we'll get into that later, but or that'll be for another podcast. But that is kind of what you're saying. So... Now, with the recognition of that odor, are you getting a behavioral change? Or are you getting a full-out response? Uh, I mean, with two trials, there'll start to be some behavioral change, but within about a day, 30 trials, 30 reinforced responses, mm-hmm. it should be full-out response towards the end of that. As I said, I mean, the way that you guys have to operate with different animals, it's not mm-hmm. like you can... You have the animal in front of you, and it's yeah, just into yeah. one of three different kinds of boxes. So that's yeah. a completely different ball game. But the actual, if it's a discernible scent that's clear to the dog, mm-hmm. that part is not. That's not the heavy lift. Really, that, I mean that is that is amazing because, you know what you, do, you. I don't know if the listeners caught that, but you just said you know over a trial of about thirty times. Well, all right, let's put that into perspective for us as hunters. How long does it take me to get my dog on 30, 30 animals game? You know, whether it be coon or bear or cat or whatever. How and, and Ariel and I talked about that in, in a podcast earlier about taking the dogs off the tree. I may treat I may treat thirty bear in a year, you know. So that's why I feel like it takes so long for me to finish a hound is because I don't have I don't have the opportunity to do um, five minute sessions and put. 15 trials in a session. Um, But from what you're telling me scientifically, and you've done this with data, that if that dog picks up that odor or is is rewarded Mm -hmm. on that odor a couple of times, let's just say a handful of times, then that dog should be able to, if it's clear, the dog would understand that this is what I'm supposed to be doing and we move on to the, the chase and then we can start working on the age of the track. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, what you and I talked about it, we feel like it's more environmentally. Um, um, our stuff is more environmentally um, issues than because yours is a controlled environment in a, you know, in a in a lab setting. Right. Um, yeah, I have the benefit of the lab, so and we automate our training. So rather yeah. getting thirty trials is yeah. is is. Easy and as simple as pushing a couple of buttons. So right, um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of if it's clear, yeah, transitioning an odor for the dog seems to be it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, for your situation, that the dog would know what different aged, you know, trails the tracks, smell right. or the tracks smell mm-hmm. like. You wouldn't necessarily know uh, how to source. Those are all things that could be that need to become a part of that mm-hmm. scent picture and each of those would take additional time. Right. So, you know, the 
you don't have the isolated, pure, you know, source of an odor that that we have the the fortunality of, and you know, narcotics explosives. So that adds a level of complexity. Yeah, and I mean, I like I said, I've said it uh, uh, several times on here. You know, I don't, I don't feel like I have a finished product hound until my dogs are about four years old, and you know, the elements and the components you're talking about. You know, can my dog trail up a track, jump the track, run it, catch it, tree it, vice, you know, whatever. If I'm rigging, which is when we put the dog on the truck and drive down a road and the dog smells the air and can that dog, you know, I feel like there's a couple of different rig dogs. Dogs don't drive across tracks. Okay. And that means basically it's crossed the road. The dog picks it up and takes it. Or, you know, that dog that can go 400 yards in there on top of that ridge where he caught the, the molecule and caught that scent and on the truck and he knows, okay, I need to go in this direction to find that odor. Mm-hmm. Um, and then to, to proof them, which we call in the police world, we proof our dogs off unwanted odors. Um, deer, coyote would be in the hunting world, you know, for, for me to get all those in three months that I get to hunt in Virginia. I mean, I feel like it takes me about four years and in four years, let's talk about repetition. Um, in four years for me, you know, let's just let's just use an average number of thirty. Um, we have been doing a little better than that as far as training and and the actual hunting season. Um, so we're probably around fifty, but let's just say thirty. Let's say that we catch thirty bear a year for four years. That's a hundred and twenty reps. Now we are going to get outrun. We're going to have to catch our dogs off because of highways and creeks and railroad tracks and. Uh, private property and stuff like that but you think about it 120 reps where you're getting 30 reps in a in a in a session Mm -hmm. you know like i said ariel and i talked about that too is you know that's why the controlled environment that we use in law enforcement makes training so much easier and so much nicer because we have an uncontrolled environment where pretty much you turn the dog loose and there you go yep yeah yep yep so, Dr. Hall, anything else on odor that you think would be important or for the learning process that would that would um, come into the hound world that we should know or maybe that, that we need to pay attention to? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's probably unlimited things. The problem is, is that <laughs> we just don't know enough about it to make uh, good yeah. answers, you know, like in my talk today, right? I, I there are lots of questions and I'm like, it depends is the answer, you know, yeah. like there's, um, so I'd say probably the underlying takeaway is that odor is complicated. It's mm-hmm. probably not doing what you think it's doing. Mm-hmm. It's probably doing something completely different. It behaves in sometimes very unpredictable ways. Uh, so appreciate the complexity. Yeah. And I always, you know, I tell, the guys, when I'm doing the when we're doing, when I'm tra- doing tracking training for man, that you know we have to trust our dog because we can't see it, we can't smell it, we have we only have theories and ideas and opinions mm-hmm. on what that odor is doing and how it's traveling and you know what is the sunlight doing to it, what is the UV doing to it, what is the humidity doing to it, how's the barometric pressure pushing it up, pushing it down, you know the thermals. You know, they're lifting them up in the mornings and they're driving them to the ground. I mean, there's so many different things that go into um, odor with mm-hmm. us um, that make it so complex. Yeah. And, you know, I always try to figure out what what's going on or what's went on. And sometimes I just stand there and scratch my head because I can't explain it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't like making excuses. Sometimes the dog just did and sometimes the dog just didn't. Yep. So well, that's the hard. You know, you don't know what's going on on the dog side. You don't know what's going on on the odor side. So you're just kind of yeah putting one confusing thing on top of another confusing thing. <laughs> so and sometimes it's just I can't smell. To be honest, yeah, uh, and uh, sometimes it's sometimes it's a miracle that it ever works. You know, and <laughs> yeah. sometimes it's like that must have been almost magic. Yes, uh, you know that. Uh, the, you know, there are definitely times where it works when it shouldn't, um, but. Yeah, part of it is just a highly complex system and um, appreciating that and also appreciating that 
we know a lot less than we think we do. Yes. I think that's one thing that um, we tend to like, oh, my dog is searching over here, you know, because it must be coming down and, you know, and dropping over here and pulling over here. That could be it. Or it could just be that there was something interesting over there. You know, mm-hmm. like a lot of times we can uh, come up with a variety, you know, when you don't know what's going on, you can come up with 10,000 explanations to explain something and none of them could be right. So um, just having that kind of appreciation of it could be anything. Yeah. And uh, sometimes, you know, you can do things to uh, entertain that curiosity and play with things and see, you know, you can set out different odors and see how they move and things like that. So I don't know, have fun with it. Yeah, I always say that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> that's what I think happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dr. Hall, I really appreciate your time. You know, I know your dad's down and you've taken time away to come and talk to us. Um, like I said, I, I really enjoy, like I said, the data, you know, sitting in the class and learning about the, the diminished drive really, like that really like got me. Mm. And, and I, I can see it in the canine work, like in the police side or the law enforcement side in our training, in our training group. And I see dogs that have a higher drive. Yep. They're going to continue on a little longer where the other ones are just like, meh, I'm done. <laughs> and, you know, and I see it in the hunting world too. And that's why, you know, you guys out there listening, the selection process for what we do is so important. It's so important that you are picking those, those dogs, um, those hounds that have that natural instinct that have that, that drive for what we are asking them to do. Um, so anyway, I appreciate your time. Uh, I've enjoyed sitting in your class and I always enjoy learning. Um, so at the end of every podcast, we ended it with, with a, a little saying, Dr. Hall, thank you for helping us find a way to teach, train and learn. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. All right.